Today, I'm gonna to talk about the three commonest types of over-the-counter painkillers that you can buy in the UK. Don't be fooled. Just because you can buy them over-the-counter doesn't mean they're safe in all circumstances. They're not. Thousands of people end up in hospital from taking everyday drugs and painkillers. This is not an exaggeration, but some are safer than others and some are more effective to deal with certain things than others too. The aim of this video is to get you up to speed with these common drugs that you and your family use all the time, how to use them safely and what you need to look out for. There are three main types of over-the-counter painkiller. Paracetamol, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that we call NSAIDs and opioids. Most people only need to take painkillers for a few days, but some people need to take them for a long time. Each of these drugs works in a different way and they can all be used together if needed. FYI, this isn't really a discussion on pain and the different types like nerve pain and joint pain, more on how to manage most types of acute and even chronic pain. There are many other drugs we use for pain management and other therapies too, but what we're discussing today is the drugs that you have access to easily that can help with most types of pain. If these drugs don't work for you or you're not sure on the why or what's going on with your pain, then do seek medical help. When you're buying medications over the counter, there may be 50 different medications to choose from when it comes to pain relief, but most of them contain the same three painkillers I've already mentioned, either alone or in combination with another painkiller or something else completely altogether, like caffeine. Some of these drugs are much more expensive than others, and they're generally unnecessary from a purely clinical and pain relief point of view. You can buy the constituent drugs much cheaper. Cheaper. Let's talk a little bit more about these three main types of drugs that you can buy. This one can be bought as pure paracetamol cheaply and its brand names include things like Calpol for kids and Panadol for adults. No one really knows for sure exactly how paracetamol works, which I find a little disconcerting but it's thought to work by blocking something called COX enzymes in the brain and spinal cord, i.e. the central nervous system. These enzymes make chemicals called prostaglandins, which cause pain and inflammation at the site of injury or damage. A lot of patients shrug their shoulders or seem completely unconvinced when you recommend that they take paracetamol. They think it's rubbish. It really, really isn't. It's still a first line medication that we give in hospital along with other drugs and it works better the longer you take it, within reason of course. This is a safe medicine and side effects are really rare if you don't take more than the maximum recommended dose. It's great for pain and to lower a high temperature, but not great for things like inflammation or swelling. For completeness sake, paracetamol can be very dangerous if you take too much, i.e. an overdose. Overdoses of paracetamol can happen by mistake, but some people intentionally take too much. The main problem with taking an overdose is that it can damage your liver permanently and you can die from this. The generic forms of this drugs are things like ibuprofen and aspirin and its brand name includes things like Nurofen for children and adults. NSAIDs also work by blocking or inhibiting the COX enzymes but in a different way to paracetamol. Topical anti-inflammatories, things you put on your skin like creams and gels work in the same way but instead of having an effect on the whole body like tablets, they only work on the area to which you've applied them makes sense. When they're applied, they're absorbed into your skin and they move deeper into the areas of the body where there's inflammation, for example, a muscle, and they relieve pain and swelling. Studies tell us that using these topical anti-inflammatories like creams and ointments can be just as effective as tablets, but with much fewer side effects. So I'm thinking things like ibuprofen gel, Voltarol, or Piroxicam, all things that you can get over the counter in the UK. So this type of thing works really well for areas of pain that are small and well localized, like wrists, elbows, ankles, and knees. It's less appropriate for generalized pain in more than one part of the body and deep muscles like the back, as it's difficult to apply this type of cream three times a day to loads of different areas, and it may not reach the problem areas if it's deep down in your body. Most people who take anti-inflammatories though take tablets. These are dirt cheap to buy and they're powerful tablets. The ones over the counter will help with most 
pain as long as you take the full dose that's recommended. This is usually 400 milligrams three times a day with food. The with food part I'll come back to. If you see your GP, they will commonly ask you to buy ibuprofen over the counter if a general anti-inflammatory is needed. If not, we can prescribe other types of NSAIDs such as naproxen. They're not necessarily stronger, but they can work better in certain circumstances. Aspirin is another type of NSAID, but we don't really use this for pain. The exception for this is migraines. It's mainly used for its anti-clotting effects in low doses for people that have had a heart attack in the past. Most people who use these drugs, at least in the short term, have no side effects or only minor ones. When you take them appropriately, the benefit usually far outweighs the potential harms of taking these drugs. However, with these drugs especially, side effects and sometimes very serious adverse effects can and do occur. There are four main ones. Anti-inflammatory sometimes cause the lining of the stomach to bleed. This is because the chemicals that are reduced by anti-inflammatories are also involved in protecting the lining of the stomach from the effects of the strong acid within the stomach. Sometimes as a result, a stomach ulcer develops. Sometimes bleeding is severe and even life-threatening. Elderly people are usually more prone to this problem, but it can occur in anybody. I've seen plenty of 20 and 30 year olds coming in with bleeding secondary to using these common anti-inflammatory drugs. The risk of bleeding into the stomach is increased if you're taking an anti-inflammatory plus other drugs like warfarin, steroids, or low dose aspirin. These combinations of medicines should only be used if absolutely necessary, i.e. that we're crystal clear that the benefit outweighs the risk. What do you do for those people that need an anti-inflammatory for pain, but have a higher risk of having something like stomach bleeding? So for example, people aged over the age of 65 with a past history of a stomach or duodenal ulcer. In these cases, another medicine may also be prescribed to protect the lining of the stomach from the effects of the anti-inflammatory. Studies have shown that people who take anti-inflammatory painkillers have a small but significant increase in the risk of developing a heart attack or stroke. Although it can occur in anybody, the risk is mainly in people already known to have cardiovascular problems, such as angina or peripheral arterial disease, and in the elderly, with the highest risk in people who've previously had a heart attack. So for example, one research study looked at people who had previously had a heart attack. The results showed a marked increase in the rate of a a second heart attack in people who are taking an anti-inflammatory compared to those who weren't. In some people with asthma, symptoms such as wheeze or breathlessness are made worse by these types of drugs. These drugs block those COX enzymes, which also activate another pathway called the lipoxygenase pathway and releases leukotrienes. And these things cause bronchospasm and exacerbation of your asthma symptoms. If your asthma does suddenly become worse due to these drugs, you should obviously stop taking the drugs and seek medical help immediately. The last big thing is kidney disease. These drugs, anti-inflammatories, can be toxic to the kidney. They cause the tubules that make up the kidney to malfunction and get inflamed, sometimes. If you have significant kidney impairment or kidney disease, I would discuss this with your doctor before considering these drugs as a first line for pain relief. The third big bucket of drugs is weak opioids or opiates. The only form of this drug over the counter in the UK is as low dose codeine, an eight milligram dose, and it's always in combination with another drug like paracetamol. You may have heard of this as something like cocodamol. Although it's called a weak opiate or opioid, it's an extremely effective pain relief medicine, and we can use it to treat difficult pain. Just for reference though, strong opioids include things like morphine or tramadol, which are controlled drugs. That means they have to be prescribed by a doctor and they're monitored closely clinically and in terms of prescribing regulations. Please do be careful when taking these mixed compounds like cocodamol. It's common for us to come across people taking things like cocodamol and then also taking things like paracetamol tablets. They're basically unintentionally double dosing on paracetamol. This is dangerous, so do be careful when using combination drugs. Paracetamol though is safe in the recommended doses, but high doses can easily cause toxicity. 
I didn't mention it yet, but these opiate drugs work by binding to opiate receptors in the central nervous system, as well as your gut and other parts of your body. This causes a decrease in the way that we feel and experience pain, as well as our reaction to it, and it increases our ability to manage it. The most common side effects of these types of weak opiates are feeling sick or being sick, particularly at the start of treatment, feeling constipated, sometimes having a dry mouth, and feeling a bit zonked out or drowsy or confused. By far the most annoying one of these symptoms is the constipation and at the over-the-counter dose you're unlikely to get any of the other side effects other than a bit of wooziness. But constipation is almost universal. You can manage this by tweaking your diet, upping your fluids and maybe even taking a laxative, a very small price to pay induce constipation and completely appropriate and fine to do for short periods of time. Remember though, opiates are addictive and people do get addicted to them. People like you and me who use it every day for this type of pain and that type of pain and find it comforting and a relief. A lot of people. There's an opiate epidemic in the US due to high levels of prescribed opiate use and numerous doctors have been caught overusing opiates and becoming addicted. People also get very tolerant to these drugs, i.e. you need more of it to get the same effect and people get used to and dependent on them. This is commoner in people who need stronger opiates over longer periods of time. This is much less of an issue with the types of over-the-counter medications we're talking about here. But as a general rule, if you find yourself taking over-the-counter opiates for more than seven days, you should definitely speak to your doctor. The type of painkiller you should take depends on the type of pain you have, the severity of the pain, your other health problems, as well as the side effects of the medicine. Paracetamol is normally advised if you your pain is not too serious and you don't have inflammation or obvious swelling. So great for things like headaches and tooth pain or pain associated with fever and viruses that can cause achy muscles. And it's definitely the safest of the bunch in terms of these medications. NSAIDs are generally advised for people who have pain and inflammation. So for example, if you have pain in your joints like arthritis or muscles with an acute back pain, but do proceed with caution. One of the main take home messages of this talk is if you have conditions that increase your risk of side effects when it comes to these common drugs, please be careful and if need be, discuss with your healthcare professional or try a first line safer alternative. Weak opiates are usually advised for more severe pain or if you've tried paracetamol and you've tried ibuprofen and they just don't seem to be working. It's rare for anyone not to be able to take one of these types of painkillers. The main reasons why you should not or could not take one of these drugs is if you've had an allergic reaction to one of them before. This is rare with things like paracetamol and NSAIDs, but much commoner with opiates. Or if you've had a serious side effect in the past, again, I'm thinking NSAIDs here as well as opiates. Or if there is a clear and frank contraindication, such as having a gastric ulcer and needing to consider an NSAID. In this case, try a safer medication or if need be, discuss with your healthcare professional. Just also one other thing, aspirin shouldn't really be taken by kids under the age of 16 years because there's a risk of the child developing something called Ray's syndrome. This is a really rare condition. For more information on using paracetamol and ibuprofen in kids, do check out my video on managing fever in kids. If you're pregnant, paracetamol is fine. Codeine is okay too for short periods if you need it, but do avoid NSAIDs. One of my bugbears is people not taking pain relief as they don't want to take anything or they think that it will mask the pain. It's fine if you don't want to take pain relief, I get that, but don't not take it because you think it will make your condition worse by hiding it. They don't hide disease. They help you manage pain while your body tries to heal. I also find that people often take these medications incorrectly. So for example, they'll have a headache, take one lot of pain relief, then say that the medication didn't work. It's always Always worth trying more than one dose of medication, so i.e. for a day, regularly at full dose to see if it helps before you write it off. Consistency even over 24 hours makes a big 
difference to the benefit of these drugs and what they can do, as opposed to taking one here and there over a week when the pain is really bad. If this is you, then you're just prolonging your discomfort. The evidence suggests that it's generally safe and worth it to take pain relief as it improves mood, it improves function, and it decreases the length of you're being unwell. This all has to be measured, of course, against the risk of drug side effects, but you shouldn't be concerned that it hides serious disease. As a general rule of thumb, if you take these medications and the pain doesn't disappear after seven days, do speak to your healthcare professional. By the way, I'm no fan of taking drugs for the heck of it, but I've seen way too many patients who suffer in pain while either avoiding or rationing or rationalizing pain relief based on assumptions that I don't think bear out in the evidence. So if needed, do take the full dose of medication and take it for as long as is needed. Like all medicines, painkillers should be taken for the shortest period of time possible in the lowest dose that does the job. In this case, controls your pain. As I said, up to seven days is usually fine for all of these, but if you need them for longer, do speak to your healthcare professional. Many thanks for watching. Till next time, stay healthy.